On Friday, June the 23rd, 2023, a horde of Wagner mercenary fighters, led by Russian oligarch Yevgeny Prigozhin, seized the southern Russian city of Rostov-on-Don, and on Saturday made a beeline for the Russian capital. For a brief period, it looked as though a major armed conflict between Wagner fighters and the Russian military was on the cards, in what would have amounted to a small-scale civil war. Prigozhin claimed the uprising was a protest against Russia's Ministry of Defense and Armed Forces Command, which he claims are incompetent, have bungled the invasion of Ukraine, and are responsible for the deaths of many Wagner soldiers. But within 24 hours, Prigozhin had told his fighters to abandon their surge for Moscow and to turn around, before crossing the point of no return. Now Prigozhin will supposedly take refuge in exile in Belarus, in exchange for avoiding punishment from the Kremlin, and his fighters will be granted amnesty for their participation in the revolt. While we wait to see what happens next, it's worth taking the time to learn a bit more about Prigozhin and the Wagner Group, the scale of their operations, their links to Russian intelligence and security apparatus, and finally, what this uprising means for Russia and Putin. Things are moving extremely quickly right now. There's a lot we don't know yet, and anyone who claims to know exactly what's going on or what's going to happen is probably chatting shit. But this video endeavors to answer some key questions and to give you the vital information and the context you need to get a good understanding of the situation as it unfolds. Let's get to it. Let's start by answering the most basic question. Who is Yevgeny Prigozhin? Yevgeny Prigozhin is a Russian oligarch who built his fortune in the late 90s and early 2000s in the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union when Russia was very much the Wild West, or East. In the 90s, Russia was emerging from decades of communism and reeling from the collapse of the Soviet Empire. Huge state-owned corporations were being sold to private investors for cents on the dollar, or kopyaks on the ruble, and ambitious businessmen seized an opportunity for rapid growth. Like any Russian businessman of that era, Prigozhin had already been involved in his fair share of shady dealings and served some time for a slew of criminal activities, including fraud and robbery, as well as some other classics like drinking too much and getting into scraps. But he struck gold in the restaurant and catering business, opening up a string of establishments in St. Petersburg, which earned him positive repute and ultimately paved the way to the gold-plated doors of the Kremlin. Prigozhin's Concord Catering Group began whining and dining the guests of Russia's new president, Vladimir Putin, who himself had risen to power via St. Petersburg, having held a string of high-profile positions in the 90s there before his move to Moscow. His reputation as the Kremlin's preferred caterer is what earned Prigozhin the nickname Putin's chef, but his days as a mere restaurateur are long gone. For well over a decade, he has funneled his vast resources into a slew of clandestine intelligence operations, financing all manner of projects designed to further the interest of the Kremlin. Prigozhin is the chief founder of Russia's Internet Research Agency, a group responsible for spreading narratives favorable to the Kremlin in various news organizations and across social media, while undermining and destabilizing any competing narratives and opposition organizations through the use of internet bots and a sea of pro-Kremlin social media users. It was Prigozhin's close links to Putin and the Kremlin, his deep pockets, and knowledge of such operations that meant he was perfectly placed to expand his area of nefarious operations from the virtual world into the physical. And that is when the Wagner Group was born. Now, the Wagner Group is believed to have been founded in late 2013, early 2014, not long after the Internet Research Agency, and until recently has effectively served as Putin's band of agents and enforcers who could further Russian interests abroad while remaining a private entity, supposedly unaffiliated with the Kremlin, thereby providing him plausible deniability. Wagner's first mission came amid Russia's annexation of Crimea from Ukraine in 2014, when they helped to arm and organize pro-Russian separatists in Ukraine's eastern Donbass region, laying the foundations for Putin's eventual invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. But in the years between Russia taking Crimea and Putin sending tanks over the Ukrainian border last year, Wagner has been very hard at work across the world. Wagner mercenaries were heavily implicated in the intervention in Syria, where they helped to prop up the Russian-friendly regime of Bashar al-Assad, the Syrian president, 
and were complicit in coordinating and conducting military operations against Syrian rebel forces. Wagner has also operated extensively throughout Africa, most notably in countries like Mali, the Central African Republic, Libya, Mozambique, and Sudan. The group's specific goals, and the methods of achieving them, differ from place to place but they are essentially working to bolster the political and military stature of governments, or the rebels, depending on the territory, that are favourable to the Kremlin. This obviously involves a lot of coercion, manipulation, and of course violence, which is why the group has been blamed for all kinds of human rights abuses, including civilian slaughter, rape, and torture. Wagner has also been linked to the intimidation, and in some cases assassination, of journalists working to expose its shady operations abroad. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Prigozhin was undoubtedly a key player in the founding of the Wagner Group. His resources uh, and knowledge of clandestine intelligence operations with the Internet Research Agency and his close relationship with Putin meant he was ideally suited to finance the private military company and guide its development. He spent years denying his involvement, only to admit late last year that he was responsible for gathering much of the equipment and resources needed to launch the endeavour. But in order to operate across continents at such scale, and with such efficacy, a much greater level of intelligence and access to resources was required. Prigozhin may be the face of the Wagner Group, and its main financier, but much of the group's inner workings were conceived, developed, and controlled by Russia's military intelligence service, the GRU. One of the other founders of the Wagner Group is a former lieutenant colonel of Russia's Spetsnaz Special Forces and legitimate neo-Nazi, Dmitry Utkin. It is believed that the Wagner Group got its name from Utkin, whose military call sign was Wagner. Other key Russian intelligence chiefs heavily involved with Wagner operations are Special Forces veterans Andrei Troshev and Konstantin Pikalov. Troshev, who fought in the Soviet-Afghan conflict and the Second Chechen War, is thought to have held a kind of chief of staff-like position in Wagner, while Pikalov is believed to have played a leading role in the annexation of Crimea and now oversees the PMC's operations on the African continent. When the war in Ukraine began, a stream of images and videos of Wagner mercenaries in eastern Ukrainian towns and cities flooded the Russian Telegram messaging app and social media, confirming their involvement in the invasion. But within months, Wagner went from seemingly deploying just tactical units in select strategic battles and acting as kind of civilian enforcers, to a fearsome fighting force that rivaled, and in many cases outstripped, their fellow Russian army counterparts. In September last year, Prigozhin became known to the world when he was filmed touring Russian penal colonies as part of a mass recruitment drive to swell his ranks with hardened criminals to fight in Ukraine. Wagner's tactics were brutal, to say the least, particularly in the months-long battle for the Ukrainian industrial city of Bakhmut, where the private military company spearheaded Russian efforts to wrest the city from Ukrainian control. The attrition rate in the battle was eye-wateringly high, with trench and artillery warfare in the woods on the outskirts of the city giving way to bitter close-quarter urban battles in the city centre. But Wagner's success on the battlefield is hard to dispute, and in May they eventually managed to do what Russia's regular army troops could not, and seize Bakhmut. The victory was short-lived, however, and since their withdrawal from the city, Ukrainian units have begun retaking some of the territory on the city's outskirts from its Russian stewards. Now, Wagner's recent uprising is so intriguing, because although the group is de jure independent from Russia's security apparatus, its inner workings are very much intertwined with the GRU, and by extension the Kremlin. It is those connections with the Russian intelligence, state security apparatus, and Kremlin funding that made it possible for the PMC to expand its operations throughout the Middle East and Africa. But sometime last year, it appears that Prigozhin assumed a more direct commanding role of Wagner's day-to-day -day operations in Ukraine, and very much became the group's spokesperson. It is reasonable to assume that Prigozhin was responsible for leading the rebellion, perhaps supported and encouraged by a group of senior Wagner officers, with considerable combat experience who are disapproving of the Russian military command's approach to the war. It is more unlikely that Prigozhin launched his revolt with the support of Russian intelligence operatives working within Wagner, but the possibility cannot be discounted.
When Wagner troops marched into Russia's southern military command headquarters in Rostov and began surging towards Moscow, many thought that a full-blown coup was on the cards. A Wagner camp near the border had purportedly been hit in a Russian airstrike and several Russian Air Force pilots were blasted out of the sky by Prigozhin's convoy in return. However, the prospect of a fully-fledged military operation to depose Vladimir Putin was never Prigozhin's intention, a point that the mercenary chief went out of his way to clarify. For months, Prigozhin has launched foul-mouthed tirades, directed not at his former friend the president, but at Russia's Ministry of Defense, Sergei Shoigu, and Army Chief, Valery Gerasimov. He has routinely questioned their competence, blamed them for the underperformance of Russia's forces in Ukraine, and accused them of limiting Wagner's effectiveness by restricting the supply of ammunition and intel, and even causing Wagner losses by pulling back regular Russian army troops from key frontline positions in the middle of battles, thereby leaving the mercenaries exposed to Ukrainian counterattacks. The final straw, he said in an audio statement, was pressure from the Russian MOD to have his mercenaries sign contracts with the army and absorb Wagner into the Russian military, as well as what he claims was an unprovoked Russian airstrike on Wagner positions that resulted in like 30 deaths. Ultimately, it appears Prigozhin decided to launch the uprising as a protest against the incompetence of Russia's defense ministry and military, to advocate for more resources and independence for Wagner, and perhaps even to lay the foundations for a role at the top of Russia's military command structure. Perhaps he felt as though his long relationship and decades of work with Putin, not to mention Wagner's successes in Ukraine and beyond, would allow him to go over the heads of Shoigu and Gerasimov to appeal directly to Putin. But in his anger and his haste, the mercenary leader made a key miscalculation. Everybody in Russia knows that Putin is the judge, jury and executioner. He decides who remains and who goes, he can demote and appoint military leaders as we've seen him do so already in Ukraine, and Defence Minister Shoigu retains his position only because Putin allows it. By that logic, it is impossible to criticise the military or a state-governed department like the Ministry of Defence without criticising Putin. Prigozhin found out as much when Putin issued a chilling address on Saturday, vowing to punish the traitors for their uprising. Now, at this point, you might be wondering why Wagner and the Russia army haven't been working together. After all, their short-term goals in Ukraine, so to defeat Ukraine's armed forces, secure a Russian hold over the country's east, and perhaps one day march on the Ukrainian capital, are very much aligned. Wagner is evidently an effective fighting force, and though the Russian army has proven less so, a united and coordinated military operation combining their strength would undoubtedly prove a fearsome prospect for Kiev's troops. But in Putin's authoritarian Russia, honesty, candor and humility are not really qualities which will serve you well in such high-profile positions. Everybody wants to tell Putin what he wants to hear, and nobody wants to admit fault. The Russian army's reputation as a major military power has been shattered by its woeful underperformance in Ukraine, largely through rank-and-file corruption in the military which has seen resources and funding for training and the purchase of maintenance of equipment skimmed off the top, embezzled and funneled away. Wagner, by contrast, has in some instances seemingly achieved very good results, but that has only served to further highlight the failures of the Russian army in Ukraine. With Russia's military leadership and defense minister unwilling, and to a certain extent unable, to admit fault, recognize their failures and work with Wagner for better results, the two entities have instead squabbled for bragging rights, detracted from one another's successes, and blamed one another for their respective failures. This tactic is admittedly short-sighted, and has undoubtedly cost thousands of Russian lives, but the people in command of Russia's troops are focused on the war second, and self-preservation first. First, let's look at what the aborted rebellion means for Prigozhin and his mercenaries. Prigozhin has supposedly been allowed to escape punishment, provided he remains in exile in Belarus, under an agreement allegedly brokered by Belarusian president and Putin ally, Alexander Lukashenko. Whether that agreement will endure remains to be seen. Russia has a storied history 
of committing assassinations, both at home and abroad, of politicians, oligarchs, former intelligence agents, journalists, and all kinds of other people who have threatened to destabilize or challenge Putin's authority in some way. It's by no means unlikely that Prigozhin will wind up dead, but we, of course, can't say for sure. On the date of this recording, Prigozhin is believed to be alive and well in Belarus, and Kremlin press secretary, Dmitry Peskov, has made a point of highlighting that the agreement will be honored, Prigozhin won't be harmed, and that Putin always keeps his word. But the uprising does seem to have hastened that which Prigozhin was so intent on preventing, the dissolution of the Wagner Group, or at least a coherent Wagner force in Ukraine. Wagner troops that were involved in the uprising will also be granted amnesty from punishment, and instead have been presented with the choice of either signing contracts to be absorbed into the Russian military, as had been decreed, or to follow their chief in exile in Belarus. It remains unclear, though, how the splintering of Wagner's operations in Ukraine and the sidelining of Prigozhin will affect the PMC's operations further afield. On the face of it, there does not appear to be any reason why Prigozhin's uprising would prevent other branches and departments of Wagner from conducting their operations in Africa and the Middle East. As we've already covered, Wagner is heavily linked to the GRU, is supported by state intelligence and funding, and is engaged in territories completely independent of the conflict in Ukraine. Putin has also claimed that Wagner's operations on Ukrainian soil have been heavily financed by the Kremlin. Again, what we don't know though is the extent to which Prigozhin had assumed direct and or maybe total command of his forces in Ukraine, and whether any senior GRU or other Russian intelligence officials were involved in orchestrating the uprising, or at the very least, understood that it was a genuine possibility. In terms of what the uprising means for Putin and the Kremlin, wild reports claiming that Prigozhin had attempted a full-on coup, or that the rebellion has shaken the foundations of the Kremlin and fast-tracked Putin's demise, are obviously false. Prigozhin was clear that his issue was with Russia's army chiefs, not Putin or Putin's authority. What's more, the matter seems to have been dealt with pretty swiftly. Within just over 24 hours of launching the uprising, the mercenary leader stood down his troops, agreed to self-exile, and handed control of Wagner over to the authorities. Putin has already made a point of publicly honoring members of Russia's National Guard for preventing a civil war, paid tribute to the small group of Air Force pilots who were shot down by Wagner's convoy en route to Moscow, and the mercenaries are, this week, handing over their weapons and equipment to Moscow's military. With civil war averted, and Wagner's units disbanded and partially absorbed into the regular army, Putin will now no longer need to contend with the mercenary threat and can deploy troops that do enlist with the army back to Ukraine. With that in mind then, it's reasonable to expect that after a period of uncertainty and wild speculation, Putin's rule will continue relatively unperturbed, at least in the short term. Having said that, it must also be said that the rebellion, however brief, was still essentially a mass mutiny against Russia's military chiefs, and as we touched upon earlier, any criticism or rebellion against Moscow's defense apparatus amounts to criticism or rebellion against the president. It was an overt expression of considerable dissatisfaction with the state of Russia's so-called special military operation across the border, a scathing indictment of the armed forces, and further confirmation that the Kremlin has so far been unable to achieve its stated goals in Ukraine. Furthermore, Wagner's mercenaries encountered almost no resistance in seizing Rostov, and made it to within about 200 kilometers of Moscow before aborting their mutiny, which suggests one of three things. One, that Russia's National Guard and defense structures were ordered not to engage. Two, that they were woefully underprepared to prevent the attack. Or three, that they were simply indifferent to Prigozhin's actions. If either of the latter two options is in fact true, which is likely the case, then the Wagner Rebellion has, at the very least, exposed the true extent of the deficit in Russia's military capabilities and has showcased the feeling of many in Russia that Putin's special military operation cannot continue in its current form. It highlights the considerable discord in the upper echelons of Russia's political and military elite, and, whichever way you cut it, suggests that Putin is no longer in complete control. This appears obvious to people in the West, but for the millions of Russians who have lived under Putin's rule for decades, 
and are fed a steady stream of state-curated media, the news of Prigozhin's uprising may well have come as a pretty big shock. But whether the rebellion proves to be a driver for change in the long term, nobody can say for certain.